Yeah, so I'm going to quickly talk a bit about, before I get into projects, why I do those projects, why I do what it is I do. Because what I do is quite similar to what a lot of people have been talking about. And the first thing I want to talk about is people often ask me, how did you start doing what it is you do? You know, when did you start doing that? And so I ask myself this, when did I start doing what I do? And to answer that question, I had to think, what it is, what is it that I do? So, and I realized that probably I started doing what I was doing when I was about four or five. And there was this toy that I'd seen somewhere. I had no idea what it was called, but I really, really wanted it. And I thought, well, I don't even know what it's called. I don't know where to get it, so what am I going to do? So I realized I could make it out of Lego. And what it was was it was something like this, where you press the trigger, this thing would extend and pick something up. So I made this out of Lego, and I thought to myself, this is so cool. I mean, there's this thing that I wanted, and I couldn't have, so I just made it. And I think that was really the start of me doing what it is I do today. Because what I do today is I think of something that I want to be able to do, that I can't do, is not necessarily possible, or you know, I just can't do it physically. And I think of a way of how can I achieve that? How can I make that? So I use whatever I can to make that a reality. And then the big breakthrough came when I was about 10, and I got one of these in 1985. This is a uh, BBC Micro Model B with 32 kilobytes of RAM. And I was very lucky I got this book as well, which if I had time I would go through. But this book is aimed at kids, and it talks about how computers work, um, what a CPU is, what computer programs are. It talks about it talks about representing a 2D array in a linear buffer aimed at 10 year olds. And you can see in the top right there, there's my very first ever um, image. And the biggest miracle is that I still have this book. I have nothing older than two years. I, I lose it all. But for some reason, I've, I've kept this book. So I'll just quickly whiz through this. It talks about sound exercises, robots, physical computing. And this is 1985, by the way. It talks about email networks and computer programs. The very first game I wrote in basic, Spider Man game. The very first generative animation. A cloud goes over a sun, it rains, flowers come out. So this basically changed my world. And yeah, I spent a lot of time programming, so I started really young. And for me, a computer was just something you switched on, it was there, you just typed in something, and it did what you wanted it to do. So fast forward to today, and I'd like to talk about what really inspires me and what it is that I try to do, and what I really model myself after, and it's this. Um, well, not specifically this, but this is a really good analogy which I'm going to use throughout uh, the presentation. This is basically a really fine piece of engineering, just amazing technology. It's actually about 300 years old, and it's, um, it's the hammer of a piano. It's not just the hammer that I'm interested in, but it's the whole instrument, because to me, this represents really the, the pinnacle of what I can try to create. On the outside, it's, it's super simple. It's just 88 keys. You hit the keys, and it makes a note. The higher keys make a higher note. The lower keys make a lower note. You hit the keys hard, you get a hard note. Hard sound, you hit the keys soft, you get a soft sound. It's interaction design at its best. It's super simple. But you give this to a master, and he can make you cry. And that really fascinates me. And what fascinates me more is the fact that this super simple shell on the inside, it's really complicated. It's not a very sort of straightforward solution which they went for to be able to allow this expressiveness that allows the master to do what he can do. So I'd like to do a quick little demo as well. If we had time, I'd play the whole song, but we said we're going to have to skip quite through. So 
this is um, the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven, played by Arthur Rubinstein. And there's 88 keys here. And this particular combination of keys invokes a very special emotion. And that combination of keys, people we're constantly trying to, especially us programmers, trying to analyze what it is about those keys that do this, and if we choose a different set of keys, it doesn't work. Especially those of us doing generative music, etc. But even though I'm a programmer and I consider myself quite technical, I quite hate that analysis because what I like to think is that it's actually magic. But I'd like to do something else as well now. This is a video that I found on YouTube of a random person. I just searched for me playing. Um, with my sonata, and I just like to play this as well. exact same notes, but it doesn't really it doesn't really touch you the same way that Rubinstein's version touched you. So what's different? It's just a tiny amount of detail in the timing and the pressure. And that tiny little detail can make the difference between you hearing the notes or hearing the song and actually feeling what the artist, the composer, the player is feeling. That little detail can make that difference. And that's the number one thing that really fascinates me. I'm obsessed with trying to understand and find that detail that makes the difference between you seeing or hearing what it actually is versus feeling what the person who created it is trying to create. So that's the number one thing that motivates me. Number two, I said that this was a little bit crap, but actually, take this person who played this, and if you play this recording back to her, she might think, yeah, it's not that good. But the duration, the time period during which she is sat at the piano and playing it, she is feeling it more than you or I felt this song when Rubinstein played it. And that fascinates me even more. So the, the, the interaction period with an instrument, that real-time interaction, is when you connect with the PC even more. So that's the two things about these instruments which really fascinate me. And, um, I don't know what slide is next, but we'll see. Oh, I'm going to have to skip this. This section was a really good section about doom, but there's a good connection, I'll have to skip that. Um, so basically, yeah, there's two modes of interacting with the instruments. This guy here, Ray, he's playing it, and he's really enjoying it. That lady over there, she's just listening to it, and she's enjoying it. These two people can be in the same room, listening to the same notes being played on the same instrument with the same person, but they hear completely different things. So what I try to do is I have two channels of work, like to say, where I create instruments for people to play. These are interactive installations. Or I create instruments for myself to play, or performers, and then the audience just watch it as a non-interactive experience, but it was created via interactive means. And to quickly demonstrate, I'll just go to a few projects. I'll quickly say one quick thing. A lot of my work involves computer vision in the past couple of years, using digital interaction. But my interests do not lie in my knowledge report style interfaces. I think Dan kind of nailed on the head when he was saying HCP versus HCI. Um, I don't get, my personal interests don't lie in trying to browse data by doing this. I'm happy using a mouse for that kind of stuff. But what I'm really interested in is that natural language when I'm talking, my hands are moving. So why am I doing that? I don't know. And I'm just trying to understand how we can use that to create visuals for music. So, yeah. So I'll start with a very um, straightforward, simple example. This is an installation I did last year. Actually, it came to Pittsburgh for um, the Via Festival not long ago. I couldn't come. Probably went well. 
So it's a big projection wall, the camera tracks you, you move, it throws paint. It's actually really, really simple. I deal with open frameworks in about three days, and um, I've seen students clone it. It's, it's technically straightforward if you're in that realm. If you're not in that realm, then it might be a bit different, but I'll just show how it works. So this is it. It's really simple. You just come and play with it. It's not a painting application. I'm not trying to make Photoshop. Um, you're not trying to create the Mona Lisa here. All that matters is what you feel when you're playing with it. When you stop moving, it fades to white, it's over. It's not about what you created. It's about how you felt when you're playing it. One thing which also interests me a lot is, you see little kids stomping in a puddle, and they can do that for hours. They, they, they think it's fun. And I tried it. it, it it's not that fun. But <laughs> I think what it is is, when you're a kid, you're learning what your body can do and how you can interact with your environment and you're just learning this so it's exciting. By the time you've reached 20 or even 10, all that stuff is boring. You've done everything that you can do with your environment. So by creating simple, I'm trying to create very simple things where it's just extending your body and you can interact with this new environment that you couldn't do before. And the good thing about this is I've shown this a lot of times, I'm actually really fed up with it. But every time I do it, I'm setting it up, I think, oh, I don't want to set this up again because I'm so bored of it. But then when I watch people play with it, um, it, it blows my mind. This guy played with it for hours. I did it in Paris um, a few months ago, and a guy and a girl who didn't know each other just broke into a dance and they danced with each other. It a weird kind of performance thing they did. And I thought that was quite, um, quite interesting. I also did a performance of body paint with a, um, with a dancer. It was, it was quite different, so I could change the background color, I could change modes, so only track outlines. I, so I was sat behind the scenes with a laptop, controlling various parameters, etc. So one thing I was very interested in is, I come from an animation background, motion graphics. I'm especially very much into music and all the visual um, media. And I found it very boring to create visuals for music in a non-interactive way, sitting there with a mouse and keyboard and placing keyframes. That's not what I want to do. I want to listen to the music. While I'm hearing the music, I want to do things. So that's part of why I learned to the interactive stuff. And I thought, what better way to direct movement to music, then, then a dancer, her body, is the, the tool to drive this instrument to create the visuals. So this is, I've done a lot of projects down this way. In fact, I don't even call these things projects. I consider the past year or two, I've actually only done one project, which isn't even finished. But projects like body paint or the next projects I'm about to show are just little tips or little excursions as to um, where I've come to. That's my button to go back to the menu. I'll show a different thing, but very similar. This was a music video for uh, Depeche Mode. It's, um, I'm not going to show the whole video, just the sections which I did, because there's other bits cut in, and we'll be short in time anyway. Everything you see is a uh, programmatically generated with open frameworks. Um, we filmed dances. The director was a friend of mine who films dances and then fed it into this software and created all these visuals, which then got put into After Effects and composited and edited, etc. programming first, but what that is is that's me designing a system and then I feed in footage and while that footage is running it's creating these visuals and I'm tweaking numbers 
usually I have an add-on called OFX Control Feed, which I will release at some point. For any application I write, I usually have at least 100 to 200 parameters on the GUI for me to tweak. I am obsessed with number tweaking. In fact, I would say 10% of what I do is algorithm development, and 90% is tweaking numbers, just getting that balance right. Um, in fact, if you're into number tweaking, I recommend a book called um, Just Six Numbers by Martin Rees. It talks about the six numbers that hold our universe together and how the delicate balance of those numbers dictates everything that's possible. And if any one of those numbers were 0.00001% off, we wouldn't have matter or we wouldn't have this or something like that. So um, numbers are very important. And I think it's important to get them right to like I said, I'm obsessed with that hunt for detail that I think can make the difference between uh, seeing it or feeling it. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. I'll show a slightly different project, if I can find it. Yeah, this one. This is a project that I did two years ago. It's my favorite project ever. This blew my mind. I'm so happy and yeah, honored to be part of it. It was for a charity called um, Streetwise Opera, who every year they do a big project with homeless people. That, that's their charity. They work with homeless people, they do opera workshops. So the project was to um, do a performance at the World Festival Hall with 100 of their performers who were, who were homeless, but through the charity um, found homes and found a life. The point of the charity is to give the homeless people a voice. And it's a 50 minute performance. Um, with an amazing soundtrack by Mara Calix from World Records. And my job was to do visuals with some friends from Flatty to do a film. And it was an abstract film, very abstract narrative. We wanted to use the performers, film them, use them in the film, but without revealing who they were, so keep it very, um, very abstract. So basically what we did was we had spoke to the, the homeless people and we created a really abstract um, a narrative, basically a journey to different emotions. And I thought I would just animate this in something like Maya or whatever. But I had a lot of time, so I said I'll just do it programmatically. So I spent two months programming. And at the end of that two months, I had a program that when you ran it, it was just black. It just did nothing. But I had 20 sliders in front of me and a mouse. I pressed play on the music. And while the music played for 50 minutes, I just sat there tweaking the numbers. I'll just show the visuals so you have an idea of, well, this is a one and a half minute excerpt from the 15 minutes piece. projected on a quite a large cylinder when everyone was sitting around and while the music was playing I could control I basically made a video game just for this um, performance and I could control all of these things that lived in there I could create send them forces I could send them emotions I could say you know die start coming alive um, start moving go to the top cluster together and I basically it was like being a director of a film and that's really what, what excites me, being able to direct in real time in response to what you're feeling at that point in time. And so um, what I call digital puppetry. And yeah, that was great. Is there time or? Let me do it for two more minutes. Sorry? I'll do it for two more minutes. We'll be right. In that case, I'll show this one. This is an experiment which started a few years ago. Um, I'll just show it. It's basically, I was thinking, it's a very, very simple idea. 
using movement to trigger notes. So that was the first incarnation. So this was the first version. It sounds a bit like a piano falling down the stairs. So I thought of you know the obvious thing, try a few different notes, uh, keys. So that led to this. So the purpose with this isn't to replace the piano, it's to create a new instrument and I have full control over it. I mean I can't play Moonlight Sonata with it, but I can control the timing, I can control the spacing, I can control whether it's going up, whether it's going down. And to be honest, it, I don't even care if it doesn't sound good to the to the audience. Um, but it's fun to play and that's why I, I created it. This ended up being an installation at Glastonbury. Um, in a 50 foot tent, which was pretty cool. To be honest, we could have just chucked a bucket of paint on the wall and people would have loved it, because it's that kind of festival. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it was still great fun. And then a few months ago, I did a new version, which is a lot smarter.